Hi. I'd like to get a couple of those bars to go and a box of these chocolates, if I could, please. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi. Today, I have a fantastic show lined up for you. We're going to start with mocha creme caramel, and we're here to get the best chocolate that there is. Then I'll show you how to make steak with green peppercorn sauce and a salad. A salad which I will serve with broiled goat cheese on top. Thank you very much. Stay tuned, because when I come back step by step, I'll show you how to make the most wonderful dessert in the world. Ciao. Mocha Creme Caramel, this is for me one of my favorite restaurant meals in terms of desserts that is also something that I love to make at home. Let's get started by making the caramel. I want to pass a little bit of important information. We start with the sugar and then we pour in the water. The heat in the pan underneath is medium, medium high, no more than that. After you add the water only once, what you want to do is to stir it around so that the sugar and the water mix well. Then walk away. Don't touch it. It has to be kept untouched for the four and a half five minutes that it takes to make caramel. We'll come back to this. Here is the making of the milk base. To this, we need to add some either half and half or cream, depending how much uh, in terms of richness you like to it. I, in the recipe, I say half and half, but trust me, sometimes I feel like a rascal and I add cream all the same. And then we're going to add chocolate. You're gonna stir this about as the chocolate is gonna melt into the milk cream mixture. And then a little bit of espresso powder. As you do this, gently move about. Your goal here is to make sure that the espresso powder does not make little, doesn't ball up, so to speak, and this smoothly flows clearly into it. So using the back of your spatula, follow it through until all the chocolate is nicely melted and the espresso powder has properly combined inside this mixture. The espresso grounds are perfectly incorporated. Now, the next thing that we need to do is to attend to the eggs. Here we are. We have three whole eggs and three egg yolks. We're going to add them. Together with this, we're going to add a little bit of vanilla. And this is something that I really want to stress. When you mix the eggs together, you want to mix them, but you do not want to beat them very, very hard. One of the reasons is that we want to avoid to create air bubbles that will be in the mixture of the creme caramel. So break the eggs, even though these eggs are fighting me. And the reason they're fighting me is because they want their sugar. And when it comes to sugar, be generous with it. Oh, here we are. We are creating the next thing that we're going to do is called tempering the eggs. Why is that we do that? Tempering the eggs is very helpful. We basically don't cook the eggs all together, but you'll see what I do now. We take the milk and we add it in a stream. And as we add it to it, what's happening, the eggs are picking up the heat. They're not cooking all the way through, but they're starting to kind of bind already. And the reason why you want to continue stirring like this is because if you didn't, you would have some scrambled eggs. This part of it is very, very important. As we add the milk and chocolate mixture, we are creating for ourselves the very base of the creme caramel. This creme caramel, of course, has chocolate and coffee inside. That's why it's called mocha. It is my favorite. If you want to go to the classic, all that you need to do is to simply omit the chocolate and the mocha. If you also want to push it to another level, one of the things that you could do is to add a liqueur your favorite. They have a lot of chocolate liqueurs out there in the marketplace today. Even rum would work wonderfully well. And we're done with this. Now, let's take a look at our caramel, see how it's doing. The caramel will take the time that it takes. When you're at home and you make this recipe for yourself, when you're at this point, most of us get really anxious. And the first temptation that you have is to stir everything around. If you do, it's gonna be a big mistake. You're gonna end up with sugar crystals. So just a couple of more minutes and we'll get it exactly the way we want it. We're almost there. The big bubbles are giving us the indication that we're just a few moments away from happening. Look, it's starting to darken now. We are here. Do not make the mistake of putting your finger in there trying to taste it. I've done that before and I've lost the skin on my finger. Very, very hot. We have our vessels in here, 
So we're gonna pour just a little bit at the bottom. The type of pan that I'm using with spouts on the side is going to be your friend forever. You use this and you will never make a mistake. Something that does not have the spouts on the side will make it a lot more difficult for you to add it because it tends to run out quite fast. And when you're dealing with stuff like this, heat, mm, pay attention to what you do. The last step I'm about to do is extremely important and it's simply to lift the piece and what you want to do is to make sure that you coat the side of it as much as possible. And here's the same thing. Just back and forth motion like this and when it hardens up, you will coat the top as well as the low upper side of this vessel. When you do this at home, at this point, what you want to do once you finish with this, you want to let the caramel rest for a few minutes until it hardens up. It will ensure that once we add the custard, the custard will not separate from it. And you will have this beautiful caramel on top later when we invert it. I have here something that I've already prepared. And now, let's actually mix the custard a little bit more and let's add it. What I'm using, as a vessel to make this a particularly good thing is a ladle, 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 ladle. You know what? I always have issue with the proper name of this instrument, but it's what makes me cute. And I'm going to pour it inside the cup. So here we go. Spot on the side, fill it around this much. Be gentle with this. Do not be in a rush. Don't worry about what's falling in the bottom. To cook this, we're going to go through a process known in Italian as bagno maria. In French, bagno marie. What it is, is the gentle cuddling of the cooking, which has some water at the bottom. I like to put hot water, as hot as you can get it, and I like to use an instrument like this that allows the secure delivery. Now, you don't want to fill it all the way to the top. You want to do it about halfway. What does it do for us? Well, this cooks in the oven. And by the way, the oven is preheated at 325 degrees. And this is going to cook for us in the oven for about 30 minutes or so. The gentle water will allow for the texture that we have come to recognize, the creme caramel. If you don't do the step, it will cook. But it will cook more like scrambled eggs than creme caramel. So we're ready. Let's put it into the oven. Let's let it cook now. These have cooked perfectly. We have taken them out of the oven and we have let them cool. Do not do this right out of the oven because you're gonna burn your hands. What I'm about to show you next is how to liberate the creme caramel from its container. It's a small trick to it. Pay attention to it, especially if you do it at home for your friends. If you get organized this way, you will never get panicky. So think up ahead and treat this almost as if it was an assembly line. So we're gonna move this to the side. I'm gonna bring in the bowl. In this bowl, I'm gonna pour some very hot water. And I'm using this coffee carafe. This hot water is gonna allow us to place the container with the creme caramel on the inside, just like this, and let it sit into the hot water for a few moments. What this will do, it will loosen up the caramel, which is at the very bottom of it, because the effect that we want to take is as soon as we turn it over, we want to make sure that the caramel pours all the way around. This technique is essential to ensure that. Once this is set here for a few moments, I'm using an offset spatula. This offset spatula, you can use a knife if you want, but I find this instrument to be most helpful. I basically lodge it on the very bottom and following the wall of the container, I go all the way around and I help myself with every bit of trickery that I can. Once this is done, you can see already there's a certain looseness to it. And now we need to unmold it. And this is the reason why you want to wait until it's cool enough. Otherwise, it will be most painful. So here it goes, pop, pop, pop. And here we go. Beautiful. The one thing that I love the most at this point is just to fix the little mistakes that I made on the side. Next to me, and you will find this technique very helpful, especially when you do at home, I've chosen the prettiest berries that I could master. I'm gonna put them there together. And then a little sprig of mint. Mocha creme caramel, a masterpiece of my youth, rendered new and young again. This used to be very fashionable in the late 80s, early 90s, and then suddenly disappeared from most restaurant menus, but not at my house. I make this because I love it, and this, this is for you.
and there you go. Next, Nick shows us how to prepare New York steak with green peppercorn sauce. Steak with green peppercorn sauce. Today I'm going to show you two different types of steaks, filet and New York. This is by far one of my favorite meals, but the sauce is the thing that I love the most. As you know, I have a passion for sauces. Let me show you to make this. It's so simple, anybody can do it. There is no secret to it, really. In the olive oil, what we're going to do, we're going to add some chopped shallots. The shallots will be, for us, the very base of the sauce. The finer you chop them, the better it is. Do not start with a super hot pan. What I want you to do is to bring this to temperature together. As the shallots are cooking slightly, softly, they're releasing the natural juices into it and really bringing the character that we want. Together with the shallots, I'm going to also add the garlic. The reason why I add the chopped garlic into this flow is quite important. What the garlic is going to do for us is going to release its own flavor, it's going to marry with the shallots, and it's going to give us the finish that we want. Since we started cooking everything together, on what was a cold pan. The next addition that I'm going to make is the mustard. Grainy mustard is the best. You can use just a tablespoon or two. Sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. Now you can see that all the ingredients are vivaciously cooking together. Just give it a couple more moments and then we'll add the other ingredients. All right, there are two school of thoughts here. The peppercorn can be added at the end. What I like is to actually add the green peppercorns at this point. These green peppercorns have been drained, quickly washed, so there is no presence of the brine, and then I'm gonna add them into the pan. The aroma is fantastic. The next thing that we're going to do, we're going to deglaze everything with brandy. Brandy is essential. Careful when you do this at home, because if the pan is super hot, the brandy at this point could flame up. Cook it until the brandy reduces by half. We got the brandy exactly where we want to have it. The next addition is beef stock. Beef stock is essential in the making of this sauce. Chicken is too weak for this. We need something that goes well with the meat, and beef stock is ideal. And together with beef stock, just to make sure that it's nice and creamy, we add a little bit of cream. Bring this to a boil, then reduce it down to a vivacious simmer, and let it cook for about 30 minutes. And at that point, you'll have the perfect consistency for the sauce. I'm gonna move this aside, and I'm gonna let it finish right over here. And here I'll put the pan in which we'll cook the steak. Let's take a look at our steaks. Our steaks are essential. We have two cuts with us here. I'm gonna show you what they are. For those of you that often like to eat meat and you go to the restaurant, I wonder if you've ever seen where a filet mignon comes from. This is the part where the filet mignon comes from. Usually tapers at the end. So the best cuts of the filet mignon are right in the middle. This one is a New York steak. This one still has the bone attached. What I like for this bone is to use the part that's at the end, it imparts a little bit more flavor. In the particular case of the steak, I will do something unique at the end that I'll show it to you as a surprise. Let's cut our filet mignon. Using a sharp knife, right into the middle. And this is the size that I like. Put this away. Here is our steak, New York. If you can, invest in the highest quality meat that you can get. Prime is the best. There is no way to get around it. It costs quite a bit of money, but trust me, the flavor is just worth it. Then at this point, plenty of salt, both on the filet and on the New York. Turn it around. We do the same thing on the other side. Same with the New York. And always a little bit of pepper. Well, I say a little bit and then you see what I do. You know me, I say one thing, I do the other. My wife tells that to me all the time. A little bit on the other side. Now, when it comes to steak, you have to choose your own portion. So if you buy a whole filet, you can cut it to the portion that you want. The oil should be nice and hot. Let's check it out and then we'll place the steak in there. When you make it at home, if you can, grill in the barbecue outside, it will taste even better. Once the meat hits the pan, reduce the heat down from high 
to medium and let the meat cook in the pan, untouched, four and a half to five minutes per side, depending on the doneness that you like to have. One of the things that I like to do when it comes to the filet, especially if I cut it this thick, is to also cook the sides. So this is what I like to do. Put a little bit on the side like this, and you want to hold it. All that you want to do really is just to sear it enough that the juices are trapped on the inside. Let this cook for another four and a half, five minutes, depending on the doneness that you want on the inside, and then we'll take them out. The last few minutes of cooking, I like to do a technique called la rosé, which is adding a little dollop of butter to the pan, so that as it melts in the middle, it allows us the ability to bathe the meat with the butter. What do we do with this? It gives the meat an additional flavor in a glazing, which is absolutely spectacular. Plus, I love doing it. It relaxes me and it makes me feel cool. Yes, that's the truth. I'm gonna do the same with our friend here, the New York steak. I'll turn the steak. As soon as the butter melts, we add it. Remember, when you cook the meat for this long of a time, do not cook it on high heat. If you cook it on high heat at home, you're going to burn the meat. And this would be a crime, especially when the meat is so gorgeous. This little bit of butter that we're doing right now is adding a lot of flavor to the meat, a lot. The meat is cooked to what I like to do it. Now we want to let it rest for about five minutes. So we'll pull it off the fire. We put it right here on this plate. Why do we rest the meat? It's extremely important because the resting process allows for all the juices to re redistribute evenly inside the meat. I'm telling you, sometimes I am so hungry, I eat my own speech. <laughs> and this is what just happened now. So let's let it rest, and then we're going to plate it to perfection. I'll show you a couple of interesting options. This is the part I love the most. Let me show you two ways of handling this. The first one is, I like to take the New York, and I like to fan it out. So here's what I'll do. I always like to get rid of the end. This end over here is full of fat. Then I like to make nice slices. When you make it for yourself, you can make it whichever way you want. Medium rare sometimes is the way that I go, and uh, my wife doesn't like it that way. So <laughs> this is the way that I cook it when I make it for us at home. Do not be greedy when you do this. There is a bone at the very end, which I want you to be very attentive. I call this the chef gift. However, my wife likes it even more than I do, and what happens is we have to fight over the bone. So I'll put the bone back in the plate, and next time I'll see it, I'll give it to her. Now, what I like to do is to move this away. This is not necessary to make it taste better. It's just one addition that you want to do if you want to be fancy schmancy. Fancy schmancy, what a word that is. You can fan it out as it is, just like this. Choose the prettiest pieces. And it makes it prettier to look at. Doesn't make it taste better. So this part is done. Let's go with what I consider to be the best part of this whole thing. I like to add the parsley here at the end. And now we go with the sauce. When you do it like this, I suggest that all that you do with the sauce is simply put it across, just like this. Have some sauce ready to go on the side. You don't need to fill it. So this is the first part of it. Allow me to just clean this up here. And this is over here. Now, the other one is our filet. The filet, what I want to do is to place it right in the middle. Many people, when you will make at home, you will notice that the part of it, the filet, is darker. But it's pretty much the way it's done at the steakhouse when they cook it in the broiler at 650 degrees. You want to seal the juices in. And this is the part that I love the most, just to see it going like this. I love this. And so, here you are. Steak with green peppercorn sauce, old-fashioned, but tell you is absolutely fantastic. When I make this at home, I am in paradise. My wife loves me not only for my pasta, but also for my steaks. And there it is.
Next, Nick shows us how to prepare green salad with broiled goat cheese. If you're gonna do a steak dinner, you need a special salad. This salad is beautiful because the goat cheese, once broiled, it becomes a wonderful creamy substance on top of crostini. But what do you do with the crostini? Let me show you. Right in here, we have done our crostini. This is nothing more than toasted bread. But before you serve it, before you put the goat cheese on top, what I want you to do is to take a piece of garlic and rub right on it. This is very important. A little bit of garlic in here has now completely penetrated the bread, giving this bread an astonishing flavor. Let's talk about the salad mix. The salad mix is very important because you want to have something that doesn't kind of wimp down. It has a lot of flavor all of its own. So what I've chosen is radicchio, and we have Treviso and Chioggia that we've chosen, Belgian endive, frise, also known as curly endive. I've taken this, uh, cut it up in small pieces, bite size, and placed it in here ready to go. And why don't we take care of this and I wanna show you how to serve this. Uh, all that I've done, I've added a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of vinegar. Balsamic vinegar is my, flavor, uh, my favorite. And I want to show you what we have done with the goat cheese. We've taken the goat cheese, placed it on top of the crostini. When you make it at home, you can make it this thin. If you want to, you can even make it almost three-quarter of an inch thick. When you do this, help yourself in the kitchen. Make sure they have everything ready. And then when your guests are sitting down, have the broiler nice and hot, put it underneath the broiler. You need about two and a half, three minutes to get this wonderful uh, burnt finish on top of it. And you'll be able to bring it out. Don't do this earlier in the day because you will take away the true texture that this does have. Let's assemble this whole dish together. This is my favorite plate. I like to build the salad into the plate. My hands, I find them to be the best tool I've ever had. You can give enormous control to all this, put some height onto it if you can, and here you are. Then you choose the crostino that you like with the perfect burn goat cheese on top of it. And as I look at this, I remember this is an old recipe, it's no longer fashionable, but one of the things that I've learned when it comes to cooking as well as fashion, everything old is new again. And this is the perfect salad for this fabulous steak dinner that we prepared together and the dessert, our mocha creme caramel. Thank you for joining me today. It was a pleasure to have you with me. I guess that before I let you go, I should at least show you the kind of drink that you want to have for your guests when they arrive to your house, right before you serve my steak dinner. We're gonna make a Manhattan. So we start out first and foremost with about two and a half ounces of your favorite whiskey or rye if you want to. In addition to that, about three quarter of an ounce of sweet vermouth. Then the true recipe, the traditional one, simply asks for a dash of Angostura bitter which is this, but when my wife makes it, she puts five, so I'm gonna do it that way because that's how I have it at home. Then you wanna close the mixer, put everything together and do the shake. And now we're basically ready to go. Here we are, the best drink of the day. I love this. My wife and I, every day at seven o'clock, we take a drink break and this is one of the things that I like to do the most. A little cherry, a little orange, and you say to yourself, what a pleasure it was to spend the day together. Your guests will come to your house. They have this wonderful drink right before you bring them into the dining room and you serve them the fabulous broiled goat cheese salad followed by the steak with the green peppercorn sauce and then the mocha creme caramel. Until next time, thank you for joining me. Friend, I understand that eating chocolate is like appreciating fine wine. Would you would you teach me something so I understand okay. the difference of the various chocolates? Um, well, let's start with um, my favorite, which is the Franz blend. All right, tell it's me a about this special blend that's made for us. It's got those wonderful, rich Venezuelan beans that give you that long chocolate flavor. Mm. After after that, you're going to taste the red fruits in it. Those are the wow. beans from, yeah, Madagascar. I, I can actually envision these pictures as you're saying it. Yes. You, you really have a dead on. Mm -hmm. I cannot so wait for the should, next one. Yes, okay, now we're gonna go to the bittersweet. Okay, I'm and gonna blindly bite into it and I want mm -hmm, you to give me the description. Mm -hmm. This is, this is um, darker chocolate, more intense chocolate, but it, it should, when we say bitter, it should not be what we call bitter. It should just be chocolate. It has a stance, I get that's, this. That's what it is. And now here we have a milk chocolate, and this is um, our favorite milk chocolate, which should be a dark milk chocolate. It should be rich, 
It should not be really sweet, but just have those wonderful, wonderful. Friend, you're not just uh, in the chocolate business. You are the couturier of chocolates. It was an absolute honor to meet you. Thank oh, you so much for sharing so much of you with us. I think that our viewers at home will really appreciate this. Oh, it was a pleasure. Nick, thank you. Grazie. We enjoyed it.